Hi, everybody. This is Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and we're excited to bring you another COVID-19 update today. We're excited to be joined by Martin Bromley, who is with the Clinical Human Factors Group, and he's going to share with us today how we can apply the science of human factors to what's happening right now on the front line. Welcome, Martin. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, it is afternoon in our time. Yes, and it's morning here. So thank you so much for joining us from all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. No problem. Uh, Martin, I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about your background and how you got involved in the work of human factors. So I, my background is as an airline pilot. I'm still an airline pilot. Uh, but 15 years ago, my then wife, Elaine, went into hospital for a routine operation. Uh, problems occurred. She remained unconscious and, in fact, died 13 days uh, after the attempted procedure. Uh, now, as the review of her care took place, um, the issues that occurred, um, it would appear, were all around human factors related problems. Uh, so the team were under immense pressure, a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario had occurred. There had been no pre-briefing of, of possibilities, no kind of, of surgery checklist or anything like that when she got in for the procedure. Um, and in essence, the team became fixated on a, a particular problem. Uh, the nurses were well aware of what the problem was and were trying to intervene, but were unable to do so. Uh, and in, in essence, uh, she was starved of oxygen completely for over 20 minutes. So as, as we reviewed the report, it was obvious that many of the things that in my industry we train for and we uh, simulate and we understand very well were not really well understood in healthcare. And I suppose for me, although I had two young children to bring up and wanted to get back to my flying job, uh, out to the side of my mind was the thought that maybe I could do something healthy and useful for healthcare. So what I did is I founded a, a charity. Uh, it brought in clinicians and academics and policymakers, and we've expanded over the last 15 years or so uh, to really just promote an understanding of human factors and the science of human factors in healthcare. So I'm very lucky uh, the chair of the group now is a... Um, a surgeon. We have a whole range of people in our group from pharmacists, um, from anaesthetists, ICU specialists, etc. Um, and uh, very proud of, of what we've managed to do. Great. Well, as you mentioned, research has shown that if we apply those human factors to, um, to healthcare, we can reduce medical errors and, and we can also help clinicians to deliver better care to their patients. But for those who are out there who maybe don't understand what the term human factors means, could you perhaps just define it a bit for us? Yeah, sure. So when you work in a uh, in any form of system, so you're in a hospital or any form of business, it doesn't matter. And you have equipment to use, you have a building to work in to move around, you have various tools, you have protocols, processes, and it's about designing those so that it's easy to get it right and hard to get it wrong. Uh, in the simplest example, using pumps that are uh, uh, of different designs but on the same ward where the keypad is in an, a different direction, for example, or an indicator light works in a different way, it takes up just a little bit of your mind, just a little bit of cognitive process to try and work it out. Humans are quite adaptable, but we can create easily create error-prone situations with the equipment around us and the design of drugs, packaging and things like that. It's not just about the design, though. It's also about how people behave with each other to make it easy to do the right things. So um, the style of leadership, the style of your communication uh, really sends a strong nonverbal message to the recipient about how you want to interact with them. So how can we behave in a way that makes it easy to do the right things? And, and really it's just trying to apply that science to day-to-day -day working. Some organizations outside of healthcare are really, really good at this. We know in aviation, this is a science we've been using for uh, most of our life, really since the, the, the Second World War, in the design of the equipment used in the way we train people. And what it does is it saves lives and it makes our day easy. And essentially, the science of human factors is really health, helpful uh, for anybody who works under any form of pressure, which in reality, we all do in today's world. And particularly at the moment, healthcare is under exceptional pressure and stress and anxiety because of COVID-19. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, that's, that 
leads me into my next question. There is a great deal of stress and anxiety, but our hospitalized patients right now are at even greater risk of medical harm than they were before the COVID crisis. But with all of the stress that the frontline is under, is this now the time to talk about continuous improvement and the science of human factors? Or should we maybe put that discussion aside until after the coronavirus crisis? So, so the irony is, is you, uh, if you just forget the term uh, uh, about continuous improvement and just think about the fact that people who have been going into work in a healthcare environment are, are all of a sudden facing enormous change anyway. Um, they uh, are using, uh, having to work in ways they weren't familiar with, uh, donning PPE, for example, um, and having to think about how teams work together, what equipment you can use, and, and, and the organization of buildings, just simply on that level. And, and often staff unfamiliar with that sort of intensive care environment or high risk environment are having to work in there to back up the staff that are there so there's an enormous amount of change going on and and the problem is that creates complexity so for me bringing the science of human factors in is not about trying to do a whole load of new stuff it's trying to do what people are doing but just doing it better finding easy ways to do it and the reality is from the front line is that right now people are making changes to processes they are doing continuous improvement all the time uh, as a way of just trying to help themselves but what I'm suggesting is that we can actually bring a little bit of science in there to help people do that. Uh, and indeed, just in the last few days in the UK, we've published guidance on the design of, of new ventilators because we have different manufacturers designing them now about how you make it easy for the staff to do the right things. There's research going on about how we make PPE easier to don and doff uh, so that reduces the chance of infection and increases the speed at which it can be done. Um, and we are also at my own charity has been involved in, in developing some guidelines around behaviours that make it easy for new teams and existing teams to work well because you're working under pressure and an element of anxiety which is which is really unfamiliar to most people in healthcare. Uh, and, and when I say that, what I mean is, is healthcare has always worked under pressure. They're used to that. Uh, and perhaps in some cases they shouldn't have had to be used to that, but that's the reality. But the problem now is that in, in, as times were, you could come into work as a healthcare practitioner, you could have a, a good day or a bad day, but you still got to go home at the end of the day. The difference now is that your life, sadly, is, is potentially at stake and really making it easy for you to do your job properly and well and making it hard to get it wrong is so critical at the moment. And, and we are seeing a massive interest in human factors science and uh, as a way of people trying to just make things better for themselves. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so, so then uh, another question, I'm sorry, I lost my question for a second. We're going to edit this part out. <laughs> um, Martin, what specific tips can you give to healthcare organizations to help healthcare workers and patients be safer in this pandemic using the science of human factors? So the first thing, obviously, is something that's probably out of most organisations' ability, but it would be to, to get equipment that is easy to use well. And some organisations have already done that, but that can, that's obviously a longer term process. So in the short term, it's something about helping teams to, um, first of all, if, if possible, the equipment they're using should be standard, so they're not using different pieces of equipment, different pieces of PPE, unless it's required. Uh, because of the nature of what they're doing. But I think the second thing should be, first of all, giving them some, some structure. When there's an enormous amount of uncertainty and anxiety, structure is really, really important. So that's protocols that are not only evidence-based, but have been designed by those doing the work and have been simulated. The role of simulation is really incredibly important. Uh, simulation is quite good because you can learn some of the technical skills, but in reality, the success or failure of a unit, and just quoted by a head of an ICU unit here in the UK recently, this is all about communication. Now that was a fairly generic term, but we know that the, the, the non-technical skills, the behaviours are absolutely critical uh, in terms of who does what, who says what. So let's have some protocols developed and simulator tested and run through multiple times so all the unintended consequences of behaviour can be drawn out. But not only that, these protocols need to work when you're under, uh, when you're, you're donned your PPE, 
and, and we need to have very simple processes. And actually, the, you mentioned the phrase continuous improvement. That's what the reality is going to have to be because you're going to be learning all the time. So organizations supporting that. Um, in terms of, of uh, more directly, what can you as an individual clinician do or what can be done to help you? Uh, we published some guidelines. These are based on uh, what we call these non-technical skills, these behaviours. So th there is obviously no evidence base around what uh, non-technical skills are particularly pertinent with COVID because it's not been around long enough. But what we do have is a lot of evidence base um, around uh, non-technical skills in other industries who have to cope with with um, these sorts of rapidly developing dynamic situations where there is a lot of personal uh, threat. So, for example, teaching pilots how to handle uh, in-flight emergencies, uh, helping uh, nuclear plant operatives deal with um, uh, issues in a nuclear plant, plant that could get out of control or oil rig workers on a, on a rig. And we can, we can learn from those and apply those in other situations because the, the real thing here is the human is the same. It doesn't matter whether it's you, me or somebody else. We still tend to react. We still have the same sorts of emotions. And, and really these guidelines are, uh, which we published on our website, are things around briefing skills. It's around skills about coping with high anxiety situations. Um, it's about how you, how you pace yourself. It's about how you slow things down. And there's a whole series of things that we've identified that can be useful. Um, but certainly having a, in terms of a hospital, helping your staff with simple structures to use, simple mnemonics, simple processes, which are, are not complicated, which are designed to be used with PPE, which are designed to be used under stress is really, really important. As I say, we've got a whole sheet here, which I know you're going to share uh, of ideas on a couple of pages. Uh, we've also got different translations and that's been contributed to by clinicians, both in the UK and in Italy as well. Well, those are excellent tips for hospitals and we really appreciate your time today. Do you have any final thoughts for organizations and clinicians out there before we conclude? Uh, I, I think the big thing is to be kind to each other and that's kind of an obvious thing to say, uh, but you know, you have to remember that for all of us, when we're under personal threat, uh, anxiety, we will act in different ways. And it's just to be tolerant of that, to recognize that. Uh, and, and really, if you can stick to simple structures, it helps everybody to have a sense of knowing what they're about to go into. There is nothing worse than going into a situation where you don't understand what you and your colleagues are about to do. The more you can clarify that before you go into a hot zone, uh, the, the more certainty it will give to your staff, the better performance, but still remembering that at the end of the day, we're all human and, and you know, those, those people will come out and need some help and support and an arm around the shoulder. Yes. Well, our clinicians certainly need that today. Lots of arms around their shoulders. So I appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. Thank you very much, Donna. Excellent. Okay. Let's okay, stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>